Hello, my name is Ruben Major. I'm a paramedic, nationwide program director and CEO of EMS University. And I'm here today to present to you the novel coronavirus 2019 management for EMS providers course. I'll be skipping a few sections. Uh, you can read the slides on your own later on. And here are the topics that we're going to be discussing today. So let's start with the introduction. The first thing I want to say when we start this class is that it's very important to follow local protocol. This particular class provides recommendations and some might be crisis related based on limited resources, but it's really up to your medical director or EMS training officer to make your own protocols and abide by them. Again, this is a recommendation course only and it's important for you to follow local protocol. SARS-2 COVID-2019 novel coronavirus has created a pandemic of enormous consequence to our society. It originated in late 2019 in China, and EMS providers are essential to mitigating this imminent threat to our public safety, and both EMS providers and healthcare workers are at extreme risk of contracting the coronavirus. This virus is transmitted both symptomatically and asymptomatically, and that's very important because initial data was really showing that uh, this was a symptomatic transmitted disease, but some of the data that's coming out now is showing as of March 26, uh, 2020, that asymptomatic transmission is quite extensive. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later on in the course. So let's talk about dispatch policies, protocols, and procedures. The first thing that's really important is to make sure that our EMDs or dispatch centers who are using EMDs are asking the screening questions that they need to ask related to COVID. And as you'll see, we have some resources here that you can take a look at that we'll be having an accompanying PowerPoint with this particular lecture. Dispatch centers who do not utilize EMD also need to be implementing screening questions if they haven't done so. And questions should inquire about the travel history, fever, respiratory symptoms, shortness of breath, and cough. And a note about the travel history is still important because there are certain hot spots. And so we just want to make sure that we're able to get that information off to who is doing the collection of information after you drop the patient off. The dispatchers really need to be relaying pertinent information, such as the positive response to screening questions, droplet precautions, whether they're indicated. And this information needs to go to field personnel so that we can take the appropriate precautions when we're on scene. Field responders should be realizing the information coming from the dispatch center might be limited and a lot of this information might be accurate, most of it in fact, but there are cases where some information that's important isn't disclosed. And so this is just really something to take into consideration when you are out there in the field on a call, especially in this particular environment. So let's talk a little bit about the background or history of the novel coronavirus. Again, this virus originated in China, Wuhan in late 2019. In fact, there is still controversy surrounding the uncertainty of its particular origins, and we might not actually know. I'll go over this because there has been some obscurity as far as the details can, are concerned related to the origin of this particular virus, which are quite interesting. And people who are studying diseases and epidemics, or in this case, pandemic, really need to be able to find out where the true source of a virus is so that they can make appropriate treatments. So in any event, uh, doctors had sounded the alarm in China, but they were silenced and in fact forced to recant the fact that there was even an issue. And there's a suggested transmission from bat to an intermediary animal uh, to humans, where the initial epidemiologic investigation in Wuhan claimed uh, that there was an association with a supermarket, they call them wet markets in China, that sold live animals. And there was initial patients who had worked in the area or had visited the area. And this, these wet markets, this wet market in particular was closed down for disinfection. What's interesting about this is as a result, there's a lot of international pressure on these wet markets. And Basically, the, the way that it works is that some of these markets will sell live animals, 
And it's, you know, it's a combination of different kinds of wildlife as well as whatever other items that are being sold in the market that maybe are a standard. And so these uh, wet markets had created initial controversy on their own and international pressure had been mounting. And so eventually China responded by imposing a ban on these wet markets. And a lot of scientists in the United States, this in fact, had claimed in all over the world that an animal, to, I mean, an intermediary to human transmission was the most likely cause. However, it's really interesting to point out that shortly after that, China has said that they tracked a prior patient in Kubai, uh, likely that was not associated with the wet market. And so I guess the moral of the story here is that we don't really know exactly what the origin was of this novel coronavirus. And so because that's the case, it's difficult for us to really make a determination that the wet markets were the primary cause of this particular issue. And so with regard to the wet markets and in, in, uh, China imposing a ban, that's great that they did that, but we still need to see if we can find out what the true origin is. However, we may never know. A little more detail on the ophthalmologist that found out about this particular virus and was trying to get information out to everybody. As person-to-person -person spread became the primary mode of transmission, this ophthalmologist at Wuhan, Li Wenliang, warned of the dangers. He believed that he was actually infected by an asymptomatic glaucoma patient. So Dr. Li was actually a ophthalmologist. He was not a medical doctor. And so when he started going around telling people in his chat group that there was potentially an infection that was exhibiting these kinds of signs and symptoms that were strange, growing at a rapid pace, he was silenced. Eventually he became infected himself and ended up dying from the novel coronavirus. This coronavirus moved quickly into Europe, Italy, and it's the United States. Some information about the lockdown in Italy. It was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization and quickly has moved its way into the US through Washington State, New York, California, and various other states. Various states of emergencies were declared you can track the current numbers using the link right there. It's a very uh, up-to-date, accurate, good source of information, almost up to the minute. And then you can also see the various lockdowns throughout the United States and federal provisions for healthcare, such as the release of stockpiles in states and around the country and throughout the states. So what this really is, is right now, more than anything else, a healthcare capacity problem. The uh, novel coronavirus has stretched the healthcare capacity pretty thin. It's prevented healthcare workers from taking care of all their patients, both coronavirus and non coronavirus. The healthcare workers are having to think outside the box. There's a limited supply of materials. And the CDC is even calling for and recommending non standard items as last resort. So, for example, the bandana face mask that you might have heard about. I know the federal government has been trying to get out the masks, the N95s as quickly as possible to the various states. But there's also limited hospital beds, resources, ventilators, medical equipment, medicine testing. Thing is, is where we're at right now, we can still learn from other countries and get ahead of this pandemic. But remember, it's very important to follow local protocol no matter what you do. Now let's talk about similar diseases. So some sisters to SARS-2, or the novel coronavirus 2019, is SARS and MERS. And so the first one I'm going to talk about today is SARS. SARS is a type of coronavirus, just like COVID 2019. It was first reported in 2003 from China, and it was thought to be transmitted from bats or cats, ultimately to humans. It's still active, but not significantly. Uh, it's uh, less infectious than SARS-2 
for COVID 2019. Approximately 8,000 cases since 2003. The key signs and symptoms include fever, cough, shortness of breath, malaise, myalgia, headache, diarrhea, shivering, and travel from this province in China. It's interesting, according to the World Health Organization, and potentially relevant to this particular pandemic that we're going under, SARS had re reappeared four times, three times from laboratory accidents in Singapore and Chinese Taipei, and once in Southern China, where the source of infection remains undetermined. We don't yet know what's going on or how, how SARS-1 came about, and now we have SARS-2, where it orig originated in a similar area where we don't know uh, what happened there. And here's some resources for you to look at as well. So the next one we're gonna talk about is the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. This is also a type of coronavirus and a sibling of SARS-2. It was first reported in September of 2012 and likely originated from camels. It's still active, but again, significantly less infectious than SARS-2. There's approximately 3,000 cases since 2012. And just something to note that's really important about these two particular illnesses, uh, SARS and MERS, they are both have a significantly higher mortality than SARS-2 does. The key signs and symptoms of MERS are fever, cough, and shortness of breath, as well as close contact with a suspected person. People who were infected lived in or recently visited the Arabian Peninsula. And again, the mortality here is three to four out of 10 people who do not survive. The treatment's generally supportive, just like it would be for any of the other coronaviruses. More information is available here using this link. And other similar diseases, uh, we have influenza, rhinoviruses, R RSV, parainfluenza, measles, mumps, and other coronaviruses. The transmission of SARS-2 or COVID-2019 is through respiratory droplets, generally through coughing or sneezing by an infected person. Symptomatic transmission is generally considered to be the highest risk factor. However, as we discussed previously as a group, asymptomatic transmission may possibly be 10% higher than symptomatic transmission. So Dr. Lee from Wuhan, China, an ophthalmologist believes he contracted coronavirus from an asymptomatic glaucoma patient. There's also a University of Texas at Austin study, which is not yet peer reviewed, that demonstrates a higher rates of infected people anywhere from five to 100 times as many as a number of confirmed cases and approximately 10% more infected people may transmit while in asymptomatic. So basically what you have is a lot of people that are walking around that are without any signs or symptoms that may be passing the virus on to other people. And so this is the reason why we're trying to get people to shelter at home and to stay out of the public so that they can not end up patients and not end up transmitting, uh, more importantly. More work needs to be done here on asymptomatic transmission, but this is really something that's important to think about when you're in the ambulance. Uh, any patient that you go on has the potential for infection, so it would be the recommendation to make sure that you have your PPE available on every call, as frustrating as that might be. It's something that you really need to think about especially considering the degree of transmission of this particular virus. Another thing that's really important to discuss is the mental and emotional care. Uh, people have been under lockdown all over the world. They're concerned about their safety and their welfare. All age groups are at home. Families are with children from different parents. There's some financial insecurities and worries. How do you pay the bills? What's going on with the employment situation? And there's still a lot of errands and work that need to be done, as well as emotional well-being of children who may not quite understand what's going on with this particular situation, why they have to stay at home, how come they can't go play with their friends. So all of these things are important for the EMT or the paramedic to be aware of when they're going out on calls and uh, visiting with people in any of the calls because people are at home and they're not getting out as much as you might be because you're on the, uh, on the unit and you're out in the open all day long. So the next lesson is signs and symptoms. 
The most critical symptoms are cough, fever, and difficulty breathing. And as you know, these are probably some of the most common signs and symptoms that you experienced when you were out there running calls for just about anything else, even before this pandemic. And so it's really taking kind of a paradigm shift where you have to start thinking about things that maybe weren't, you know, that critical or that important and starting to think about them in a completely different way. So these signs and symptoms, these critical symptoms really need to be highlighted. And whenever these do occur, you're going to want to make sure that you have your PPE available. You might also see with the coronavirus, novel coronavirus, tiredness, aches, runny nose, and sore throat. And here's a sample screening guideline. This one's from Arizona. Do not forget about asymptomatic transmission. This is why it's good to have your PPE on and available for every call. Make sure again that you're following your own local protocol. The patient assessment. Data suggests that when symptoms appear, it can occur as in few as two days or as long as 14 days, with the average being about five days after exposure to the virus that causes COVID-2019. The symptoms include fever, cough, difficulty breathing, and shortness of breath. And you can see there's a little thing here from the CDC. Again, the most important thing is that you're following your local protocol. This virus causing COVID-19 is called SARS coronavirus 2. It is thought to spread mainly from person to person by respiratory droplets. Um, we went over this a little bit before. Among close contacts, respiratory droplets are produced when infected person sneezes or coughs, and these can land in your mouth or nose, or possibly inhaled into the lungs of people who are nearby. And close contact might include being approximately six within six feet of an individual with COVID-19 for a prolonged period of time. Physical distancing is important. So uh, having direct contact with bodily fluids such as blood, phlegm, and respiratory droplets from an individual with COVID-19 can present some serious risks for you. If uh, dispatchers are suspecting that the patient is having COVID-19 signs or symptoms, that you basically should make sure you put your PPE on before you enter the scene, and you should also consider these risk factors. If the information about COVID-19, remember your physical distance is about six feet, and hasn't been provided by the dispatchers, you should still be maintaining six feet from the patient if possible. And again, I would I would strongly recommend PPE on all your calls. Obviously, you're gloving up, but you know we're thinking other things like, you know, looking at putting your mask on, your goggles, your gown, all that stuff. And it's a lot of work. You've got to make sure to protect yourself and your family. One thing that is very simple but extremely important is that if you know somebody or suspect somebody to be a COVID-19 patient, place uh, one of your masks on them so that if they do cough or sneeze, you're not getting the degree of respiratory droplets everywhere. Make sure you follow standard procedures and use the appropriate PPE for evaluating your patients with uh, potential respiratory infections and limit the exposure. So, you know, again, putting a face mask on the patient for source control. If a nasal cannula is in place, a face mask could be worn over the nasal cannula. Alternatively, a oxygen mask can be used if clinically indicated. And if the patient requires intubation, we're gonna be talking about that here in just a second regarding aerosol generating procedures. Uh, during transport, remember to limit the number of providers in the patient compartment to essential personnel to minimize potential exposures. And again, having a separate area is important too. A personal protective equipment and infection control. So we'll have a little video here that you can watch on that. Just make sure you're minimizing your chance of exposure, adhering to the standard based precautions, and also doing this when you have a aerosol generating procedure that you're doing. If you're an employer, make sure you're monitoring and managing uh, ill and exposed healthcare personnel. Also training and educating healthcare personnel is important on this particular virus. You gotta make sure that you're implementing environmental infection controls and establish reporting between these agencies and the hospital. And again, cannot be uh, stated enough, put a mask on patients who have the symptoms of COVID-19. Protect yourself, gown up. During the initial outbreak, 
we saw that the doctors that were managing COVID-19 patients were wearing full gowns. And in fact, many of the healthcare workers and even law enforcement officials were wearing PPE when they were dealing with this initial outbreak in China. And this moved its way over to Italy. And we should make sure that we're continuing to do the same throughout. I know I've seen some pictures out there where people are managing COVID-19 patients and they're really not adhering to the proper PPE. It is a pain. I understand that to have your, have to put on the gown and have to put on your mask and everything else for all these calls. But if you don't do this, you may become exposed and it can be very detrimental to your health as well as to your patient's health because you may end up being an asymptomatic transmitter of this particular disease too. So you could spread it and not even know it. Pay extra special attention to your personal protection to avoid contracting the novel coronavirus. Again, gown, mask, or respirator, goggles, or face shield and gloves. And take a look at this CDC recommendation picture here on how to uh, put your mask on and your gown and all that. So let's talk patient management. For COVID-19, care is generally supportive as it is for other respiratory illnesses. As of March 26, 2020, today, there's no known cure and no known vaccination. Currently, there are some things that are taking place where we have a bunch of drug companies that are basically out there searching for the cure. And we have plasma from previously infected patients that can be injected into infected patients to minimize their signs and symptoms and the severity of their illness. This has shown some promise. I guess we're kind of going to go ahead with some of these studies to see how this ends up going and working for people who might be infected with COVID-19. Make sure you minimize the exposure of yourself, your crew, and other people. Okay, so aerosol generating procedures. So what's an aerosol generating procedure? Well, that would be anything that could potentially expel air into the environment in a way that maybe wouldn't normally take place. So for example, let's say that you're giving an SBN to a patient or using a nebulizer, using CPAP, or you intubated someone and maybe you know we have CPR that's, that's occurring and you're working on the airway, there's a bag valve mask involved, those kinds of things. We need to make sure that we are minimizing these particular procedures as much as we possibly can to minimize the risk of exposure to ourselves, to our bystanders and anybody else who might be uh, surrounding the patient and the other providers. Also make sure you're following local protocol. The insertion of advanced airways. Now, if an advanced airway is required, it's suggested that you use the eye gel over an endotracheal tube. If an aerosol generating procedure can't be avoided, if you're treating the patient, you must use P100, preferably, or an N95 filtering face piece respirator. So like an N95 respira respirator, these are very important to provide your you with protection. If it's limited, these should be prioritized for these particular procedures. Air circulation is incredibly important. So if you're gonna do an aerosol generating procedure, make sure that the exhaust fan and the appropriate ventilation methods are employed within your ambulance and any ongoing nebulizer treatments need to be discontinued before you enter the hospital. That way you're not exposing a bunch of people. So what do you do when you're transporting an infected or potentially infected COVID-19 patient? Well, make sure that you notify the receiving facility so that they know what's going on and who's coming. Keep the patient separated from other people. Make sure you put a mask on the patient and don't permit family members to ride along if possible. I would definitely take a hard line on this because this is an enclosed space and you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you minimize their exposure as much as possible. But if for some reason that you can't avoid having them come with you, make sure that you have them wear a, a mask. And also 
it's really important here to recognize that it's important for you to uh, follow local protocol. Isolate the driver of the ambulance from the patient compartment and use air that is not circulated. So basically you're gonna to wanna to blow air out. And if you have a rear exhaust fan, make sure you're using it. Utilize recirculating ventilation unit that passes the air through the HEPA filter. If you have one available, and there's certain units that do have this and, some, and many units do not, but airflow is the key here. So let's talk documentation. This should be done after the patient has been transferred to the hospital or whatever receiving facility that you're taking them to. And all of your PPE has been removed and everything, you have been disinfected. So basically you don't wanna contaminate the paperwork or if you're using an electronic PCR, you don't wanna contaminate your ePCR. In addition to the normal documentation, make sure you're including a list of everyone who could have come into contact with the patient. Also include public safety providers, level of contact with the patient. So basically you're gonna say, you know, based how much contact did anybody that was on scene have with the patient? And you wanna share this with your public health authority so that they can kind of track down who may or may not have been exposed to this particular virus. And again, it's important to follow local protocol. So let's talk about cleaning the ambulance or rescue after transport. This can be pretty cumbersome, but it's incredibly important to make sure that you have a clean ambulance so that you are not exposing yourself, other patients that might be in the ambulance, and you're not exposing the crew that's coming in after you. Again, a lot of this is basic biohazard containment stuff that you learned in EMT school. Make sure you're following your standard cleaning procedures. Leave your door open to increase the airflow. And when you're cleaning the vehicle, make sure that you have a gloves, gloves on, gown, face mask, or face shield, and goggles. So you gotta, gotta do yourself all the way back up so that you can clean that ambulance. The door should remain open during your cleaning so that you're not further exposing yourself. And make sure that you're using an EPA hospital grade disinfectant. Now, it may be that your particular agency does not have this disinfectant on the ambulance, and maybe they had something else that was used for cleaning floors but wasn't necessarily a disinfectant that would kill the SARS novel coronavirus. So make sure you're taking a look at the uh, CDC's list of disinfectant for use against the SARS-2 virus. Make sure you also clean anywhere where contact might have occurred, including droplet or aerosolized contact. Dispose of a used, any used PPE and avoid shaking linens because you can create your own aerosols from those linens. And here's how to remove a glove. Plenty of training videos out there on how to remove a glove. Uh, but this was a particularly good one. Personal decontamination after shift. Now, I don't hear this discussed about a lot, but this is incredibly important because you want to make sure that you're not exposing your family or whoever it is that you meet at home with any kind of nasty things that you might have encountered when you were out there in the field. So here's the recommendations. Although, although they may not always be possible, the most ideal situation is for you to take a shower after your shift and decontaminate yourself completely before you're leaving work. A uniform should be kept separate from pers personal household clothing. Make sure you put on your street clothes before leaving work and uniform should not be washed with the items that you're using you know, at home, like your personal items. Again, this isn't really possible for many providers and more employers really need to be flexible and compli compliant about this issue nationwide. I, I know that there are many stations out there that don't have laundry facilities available for their employees and is definitely something that needs to change. Some providers put their uniforms in a bag and take them home to wash them separately. Other providers wash their uniforms with their personal clothing. You definitely don't want to do that. 
Remember that having good personal hygiene will help to keep you and your family healthy. And don't take your diseases <laughs> that you might have inquired while you were on shift on your clothes home. And this is a follow-up information. So this is follow-up about COVID-19 cases. Be sure you notify the appropriate public health authority. We talked about that a little bit in the previous lessons. We wanna track the spread and other characteristics of COVID-19 as much as possible. It may flood the system, but we're trying to track as many patients as we possibly can to our capacity. EMS agencies should develop an exposure control plan, which includes SARS coronavirus too. These EMS agencies should also have non-putative sick leave policies per the CDC recommendations. So if, if you're an employer, make sure that you're taking into account that there's a, a high chance that your employees could become exposed and they should not be forced to work while they're sick. Notify your chain of command regarding potential exposure and be alert for symptoms of novel coronavirus 2019. Kind of dovetailing onto uh, EMS employer responsibilities. So infection control procedures are, in, are essential. We can describe, and we have, how to safely put on and take off PPE to provide current information on the transmission of infectious diseases. So employers should be providing training on the use of PPE and contamination prevention, as well as medically clearing and training staff, fit testing staff for respiratory protection devices, respirators. And this is you know, a very good reason why after we do finally get over the SARS-2 coronavirus to make sure that we're getting our providers uh, fit tested and to have their own respiratory protection devices, respirators. If there ever was a reason for that to occur, this would be it. Ensure proper supplies of PPE and EPA registered disinfectants. And we talked about those before, your list is available at the CDC website. Ensure staff and or contractors are properly trained in biohazard waste disposal and develop an exposure control plan, again, specific to coronavirus and COVID-2019. EMS agencies should have non-punitive sick leave policies. Again, this is a very, very important thing. And I think this is one of the last chapters. So public education, this is very important. Our biggest problem that we're having right now is healthcare capacity. And we talked about this at the very beginning of the course. We can increase the capacity of our healthcare system in the following ways, we need to build more hospitals, increase the medical supplies that we have available to us, such as PPE, masks, gowns, gloves, face shields, goggles, and other PPE. Ventilators, increase the number and increase capacity of ventilators to hold multiple patients. I know I've seen a few articles and information on how that can be done. And again, you make sure that you're following local protocols, but you know, desperate times call for desperate but may well thought out, but maybe well thought out uh, measures. Medications, vaccines, treatments, fast track approvals, if they're effective. And again, following local protocols, using all kinds of physicians and medical professionals. So we've seen kind of a buildup of this. I know that uh, California has called for retired healthcare providers to help. And these disaster Plans can also include out-of-state healthcare workers that may be residing in one state, but maybe they were licensed in another. Retired military could help in a different capacity. Students, and I know this is a big problem for us because there have been many of these agencies that have actually shut down their clinical training sites. And I think it's a travesty because we now have EMT students that are not going to be able to get their clinical training. And what a better time to have EMT students trained than during a pandemic. But not only that, EMT students can save lives. Paramedic students could save lives in the hospital by ventilating patients that may not be otherwise be able to be ventilated. And so there has to be a real concerted effort by governmental agencies and state health authorities to uh, prevent these hospitals from closing down their programs to students who could actually save a lot of people's lives. We can train providers more quickly. 
We can also do medical ships, which uh, there have been some ships that have been set up specifically for coronavirus. And uh, military assistance, which we do see in some areas in the US. You can use empty hotels, which has been done in many countries all over the world for the novel coronavirus. And putting previously isolated providers back to work can increase capacity. Now, what, what's really interesting about this is that as you have a pandemic and you're isolating providers, maybe because they had an exposure, you're also taking them out of work and you desperately need them. So at some point, there has to be a real discussion about taking patients who are isolated and asymptomatic out of commission to prevent them from being able to help other people. So some of the things that have been suggested, and again, some of this is a little controversial, but it's important to point out because we're in a situation where we need to think outside the box. And again, you've got to follow local protocol, but you can have asymptomatic providers out there, you know, on the job, helping people out as long as they have the proper PPE while they're delivering care. But again, remember to follow local protocol. The other thing with our healthcare capacity issues that we're having is that there are some concerted efforts that we can take to decrease the load on this healthcare system, because it's not just about patients that have COVID-19, but other patients who might not be able to be treated who don't have COVID-19, but maybe they have critical symptoms and they would have needed a ventilator, but that's being used up by somebody who has COVID-19. So, you know, there's, there's the, the normal capacity that we have in a healthcare system. And then all of a sudden with this pandemic, it, we're being stretched very thin. So we want to try to decrease the load by flattening the curve, telling people to stay at home. That's what these quarantines and lockdowns are all about. And we also want to decrease the number of infected patients. And this can actually be done by improving patients' immune system. So, you know, they need, if they can get more sleep, they're less likely to be susceptible to the virus. They can take, you know, their vitamins, make sure they're getting their exercise and obviously maintaining their uh, physical distance as required by law and uh, wherever the lockdowns are at and stress reduction. Another thing that can decrease the load on the healthcare system is remote medicine. You can basically start diagnosing people on the internet and you know, getting them the things that they need without them ever even having to go in to see the actual physical doctor, telemedicine. Uh, decrease the number of patients in the hospital. So I know there's some hospitals that are actually setting up triage areas outside of the hospital, which is good. And then treat and release programs for EMS. I know there's a number of states that are allowing EMS providers to now treat and release. And you can also, on that note about treat and release, making sure that the most critical patients are taken care of. And then uh, using your urgent cares, which is another thing that could be used as a way to triage the entire system and decrease the load on the healthcare system. So this is not just something that a an EMS agency should be doing on its own. It's also a public outreach issue. So if you're talking to patients, you should be talking to them about what they can do to decrease the load. And again, there's some things on here on this particular slide that you can do and inform patients about and potential patients and the public about in order to make this situation the best possible situation given the scenario. So we have some additional resources and we're just about wrapping up here. The CDC, a good additional resource is the World Health Organization. Consider taking a look at your state and county EMS authority websites for new protocols, as well as you can look at ems.gov and uh, NICHTA. And uh, this one is from the Infectious Disease Playbook, which is also a really good source of information uh, that I would recommend that you take a look at if you have time. And if there's any others, just let us know. And that is going to be about it for this particular course. So if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments, or you can send us an email or meet us in live chat. Thank you so much for listening to this lecture, and I will see you again next time.